Good evening and welcome to the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute's March Science Hour. I'm Chris Bolzan, GMGI's Executive Director. Tonight is all about ocean microbes and we are excited to be joined by Dr. Angelique White of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In reviewing our guest list for this evening, I saw once again, many new names new to our organization. So it is so thrilling for us to continue to see our virtual science community grow. Welcome, we are so glad you've tuned in. For our Loyal Science Hour followers, we are grateful that you continue to join us each month and share our passion for science education. For those new to GMGI, we address critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education by bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. On our website, gmgi.org, you can learn more about our research projects, meet our team, read our news. You can get a peek inside our biomanufacturing learning environment at the Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. You can also watch prior episodes of the GMGI Science Hour and a great deal more. So I encourage everyone, especially those new to the organization, to please check it out. There's a lot happening at GMGI these days, and we will in fact be hosting a series of events this spring at our institute in person on the harbor to create opportunities to meet, mingle, and learn from our science team and other innovators in our network. We will return to our in-person annual science forum in Gloucester this spring on May 14th as well. And at our academy, we're offering an open house this coming Tuesday from 3 to 5 p.m., April 5th. The public is welcome to come learn more about our 10-month program for high school graduates interested in pursuing careers in the life sciences and biotechnology. I hope to see you all there. And please feel free to share the open house news with others who might like to join our class of 2023. Applications are open and we will enroll 40 students this fall, two times our usual number in two cohorts. The class of 2022 began their paid industry internships this week. We're wishing them lots of luck. And if you'd like to follow along on their journeys, you can tune in to our social media channels. Tonight, I encourage you to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you have for our speaker. Thank you all again for tuning in and for continuing to share in our excitement for our oceans and science education. I'm gonna turn the screen now over to Dr. Andrea Bodner, GMGI's Donald G. Combe Science Director, who will introduce our talk. Andrea. Thanks, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm Andrea Bodner, the Science uh, Director here at GMGI, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, Science Hour speaker, Dr. Angelique White. Uh, Angelique is a biological oceanographer and an associate professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She received her Bachelor's of Science and Master of Science degrees from the University of Alabama, Alabama in Huntsville and her PhD in Biological Oceanography from Oregon State University. Upon completing her PhD, she joined the faculty at Oregon State before moving to the University of Hawaii in 2018. Her research is focused on studying some of the smallest inhabitants of our world's oceans, the plankton and phytoplankton that make up the base of the food web on which every other organism depends. She's interested in their biology, their ecology, and their resilience in the face of environmental change. Angelique is also the principal investigator of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program, referred to as HOTS. HOTS is a long-term ocean monitoring program that started in 1988 making monthly observations of the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the water column at Station Aloha, which is located about 100 kilometers north of Oahu. Um, this has been an incredibly important data set for understanding changes in the Pacific Ocean over more than three decades. In 2012, Angelique was named an Alfred P. Sloan Fellow, and in 2015, she was the recipient of the American Geophysical Union Ocean Sciences Early Career Award and the Jens Schindler Early Career Award in recognition for her contributions to research, science training, and broader societal issues. 
Her beautiful images of uh, marine phytoplankton have been featured in art exhibitions and her 2020 TED talk has been uh, recognized as, as, and made the list of one of the most watched TED talks. Tonight, we're honored to have Angelique with us for the Science Hour, and we really look forward to hearing about her work investigating how microbes uh, nurture our planet. And take it away, Angelique. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it very much. Um, let me see if I can get this up here. And actually, okay. So hopefully you can see me now. Are you seeing the screen? Nope, you're not. Okay, how about now? Awesome. Put pointer on here. Okay, great. Yeah, my, my mom watched that TED talk a lot of times to get me on the top 20 list. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully a few other people will check it out. Um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your evenings um, to hear the message that I want to share with you today. I'm going to discuss the North Pacific Ocean um, in the era of climate change. And I want to talk about observations and how we move from these critical observations into action. I'll focus on the Pacific because it's my home, um, but also because it's the largest ocean basin on the planet which you can see from this image. It's about 160 square kilometers and it contains half of the free water on earth. And because of the microbial denizens of this ocean, um, this planet has really has a lot to thank for the actions of microbes on the ocean. The Pacific plays a very important role in climate and sustainability of our planet. Before I talk about the Pacific, I wanna share this really beautiful illustration by the artist, Rachel Lignoski. Um, it's a reminder that whether or not you're a carnivore or a vegetarian, we all eat the sun. If it's on land or in the sea, the base of the food web, autotrophs, they harvest energy from the sun to generate organic matter. The first rung in this ocean food chain are microbes. They turn sunlight into cells, which ultimately feeds the rest of us that are incapable of this spectacular feat. One of your vocabulary words today was primary productivity. It's a rather boring sounding process for a critical ecosystem function, but it involves the drawdown of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. It generates organic matter that feeds the entire ocean. It liberates oxygen and it ultimately is the pulse of the ocean. This process is driven by phytoplankton. Phyto, it means plant, and plankton refers to the fact that they're drifters. They are so small that they are at the mercy of currents. And by small, I mean microns in size, millionths of a meter. And they are wildly abundant, millions in a single milliliter of seawater. These are tiny lives that are driven by the need for nutrients, light, and the avoidance of death. Here's some images of them. Their efforts regulate climate and generate carbon, and a fraction of that is exported to the deep. And we'll talk about what that means for climate in a few minutes here. These organisms, and I share this at every single talk that I have ever given, and I still get excited looking under microscopes because they are so beautiful. And they come in a variety of shapes and sizes and colors with hard skeletons and spines, others solitary little circles. Um, some, my very favorite in the world, trichodesmium, um, are searching for their kin and live in, in little colonies that thrive off one another. So they are incredibly beautiful. But on top of that beauty, they drive elemental cycles. They transform carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus into cells that help regulate climate through their growth and metabolism. Pasteur once said that society can exist, live and survive only due to thanks to the constant intervention of microbes, the great deliverers of death, but also dispensers of matter. And I think that is a very apt quote for any biological oceanographer trying to understand microbial metabolism. So how do they contribute? 
let's talk about the ways in which they contribute to climate and provide critical ecosystem services. Phytoplankton consume carbon dioxide through air-sea gas exchange. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is dissolved in seawater. That draws the, it drives the exchange or drawdown of CO2 from the air into the ocean. That CO2 literally becomes locked inside of cells. That's primary productivity. They're consuming inorganic carbon for growth. When these organisms die or are eaten, a fraction of that carbon sinks to the deep sea, essentially pumping atmospheric carbon dioxide into the deep ocean. This is a process that we call export or oftentimes carbon sequestration. It's the life and death of phytoplankton that literally impacts the composition of our atmosphere and regulates aspects of our planet's climate. So now you know why we care so very much about their daily lives. And I wanna ask the question, what are we asking of these microbes? More specifically, as we're changing the environment, how are they responding to that changing environment? But as Andrea introduced, you can't ask questions about change without a sense of history. Simply, you need a time series. And that is my job nowadays. I run the Hawaii Ocean Time Series. Um, this is a sentinel monitoring site in the remote Pacific. Um, since 1988, we've made monthly pilgrimage um, to this area. And, and we're now on our 334th cruise, which is pretty crazy. Um, but it's humbling to me every time I see these images of our planet, um, this little dot, <laughs> Station Aloha, it means a, a long-term ocean habitat assessment. And really we're trying to understand this massive ecosystem, um, the North Pacific subtropical gyre. And that's what I wanna share to you today, what we've learned from this time series. What is the habitat assessment for microbes? Just a little more about HOT. Um, these are monthly cruises. As I said, we're on 334. Um, there's more than 50 core measurements. And what I mean by a core measurement is a measurement that we take every single time. And that can range from chlorophyll, looking at the concentration of pigments, to wind speed, to sea surface temperature, to currents at the base of the photic zone, to you know, what the sediments look like at the bottom of the ocean. We also have a really special focus on the building box of life, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. This allows us to ask, ask questions about microbial community dynamics. So with this rich time series in mind, I wanna share some vignettes on what we've learned about this ocean and how it's changing. We are recording ocean heat waves. They're in this sense, maybe more like hot flashes. I know not everyone's used to looking at ocean temperature and maybe not even seeing things in uh, units Celsius. So let me explain this slide to you. This is a sea surface temperature anomaly. And so basically what we're taking are measurements, either from the time series in black or from satellites in red. And we're taking every one of those measurements and removing what the monthly average would be. So if you make a measurement in January, you remove the climatological January mean. And that gives you an anomaly. And in this top series, I'm showing you what that looks like in the surface ocean. And on the bottom is if you look at from the surface to 200 meters below the surface over our 30 year time series, you can see these areas in blue where it's uh, colder than usual to these areas in red and yellow that are warmer than usual. And so here's an important point here. This red line is one degree Celsius. So one degree Celsius more than normal. You can start to see over the time series, there are, there are cycles. Um, some of these are natural cycles, but there are these spikes. We're starting to get above a degree. In the last decade, um, we've started to see spikes above a degree and a half. So 1.5 degrees Celsius deviations in the mean temperature of these gyres. These systems really like stability. 
And this is a very large change. What is a degree and a half Celsius? You can think of our bodies, we sort of run at about 37 Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. So if, it, if you were to warm by a degree and a half, you'd have a temperature of 101, right? You wouldn't quite function the same and neither do ocean ecosystems. This excess heat, it increases microbial metabolism, but it also stratifies the water column. And in doing that, it increases the separation of light in the surface from nutrients at depth. And phytoplankton, like plants in your garden, need both of those things in order to grow. So we're just now getting an impact on the impact of these warm um, waters and how they're changing microbial ecosystems. Now, what we do know is that the North Pacific subtropical gyre is not the most impacted by the warming climate. Here are simulated changes in global temperature from the latest IPCC assessment. And with every additional amount of global warming, these changes are getting larger. This 1.5 degrees is important, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but you can start to see this is the contour plot of degrees Celsius change. So darker reds are higher changes. And if we warm our, plan our planet to one and a half degrees, if we warm our planet to two degrees, to four degrees, you can see that this, this heat is not distributed equally, right? The poles are the most sensitive. There's going to be sea ice melt and sea level rise. That is not reversible. These changes will impact weather, growing seasons, and nearly every aspect of life on planet. And the important part is they're not evenly distributed. There are places that will be hit much harder. And to be fair, Hawaii is in a pretty resilient spot due to our isolation and location. What else is changing? Um, I, I also show this in every single slide because I think people ought to know if they have not seen it, that this is real, measurable, persistent change. This is the iconic Keeling curve from, um, I've sort of parsed it just to look at the time series of Station Aloha. This is the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere measured off of the big island of Hawaii at Mauna Kea. Air-sea gas exchange happens, so CO2 rises in the atmosphere and we can measure the change in CO2 at Station Aloha in surface seawater. This is the power of time series and the reason we thank all of the taxpayers for supporting these time series. Without sustained observations, we would not have a clear picture of how the burning of fossil fuels is fundamentally changing the chemistry of ocean seawater. This is that fundamental change. This is the pH of seawater. And you can see as you increase CO2, you're changing the pH, you're becoming less basic over time. There's a linear response between those two factors. So what does that matter? These changes in carbon content lead to pH changes through a very complex cascade of chemical processes. This is termed ocean acidification and it's the reduction of pH in seawater. If you look at these bottom three plots, this top one is the, what I just showed you. CO2 increases in the atmosphere, it increases in the ocean. This is the response of pH in the top 30 meters. Also, nearly 300 meters below the surface, you also see a linear decline in pH. And that makes it harder for certain organisms like these charismatic little phytoplankton called coccolithophores to build their shells. Building their shells requires a really specific pH. And as we add CO2, we're moving away from that sweet spot where it makes, them, makes it easy for the, them to build these shells. And as you can see from these scanning electron micrographs, these shells are crazy. They're really like wildly diverse. We don't know why they build them or why they do them. Why do you have a trumpet versus a you know, spear versus these little uh, cereal looking discs, right? We don't know why they come in that many shapes and sizes. Uh, but the hypotheses include protection from grazing, right, from being eaten, uh, or maybe it's protection from viruses. But clearly they need them. 
and the changes in ocean acidity are doing them no favors. Another really important question we can ask by interrogating time series is whether growth or this primary production has changed. Has this critical ecosystem service faltered? Right? This is that drawdown of CO2 and then the ultimate export or pump. So that's the question I wanna answer for you now. The answer is in fact, no, the rate of microbial growth is increasing with time. Over this 30 plus year time series, we have seen measurable increases in the rate of primary production. And that's what I'm showing you here. Um, this is the rate of primary production over time. I'm just showing you in this example, summers. And so you can see from summer to summer, they're getting more and more productive. And there's a positive long-term linear trend in this increase in production. We also see increases in the concentration of the pigment chlorophyll that is unique to all phytoplankton. Um, so we're looking at these changes and this is a really robust finding that we're seeing increased productivity and microbes are working harder, moving more carbon from the atmosphere to the deep ocean. And our questions are why and how this is happening. Our working hypothesis is that someone is dosing the system with added nutrients. That anthropogenic iron and nitrogen from burning of fossil fuels, specifically from Asia, where coal plants lead to large inputs of pollutants and nutrients to the atmosphere. These nutrients are carried by winds far afield from um, where they're deposited in the Western Pacific. And that's what I'm showing you here. Um, actually, let me get the uh, pointer back. Okay, that's what I'm showing you here. Um, this is from a um, global model of the rate of um, anthropogenic nitrogen deposition and iron deposition. And so the yellows are high deposition and the dark greens are lower deposition. And what you can see is that you see these sort of plumes of, of yellow in the Pacific, right? So these models suggest that we're seeing enhanced deposition of anthropogenic nutrients. Iron and phosphorus are needed for growth. And our hypothesis are that these, um, these added nutrients are increasing the rate of primary productivity. They're necessary for growth. This ecosystem is strongly nutrient limited. And so any doses of nutrients generally tend to increase microbial production. We are certainly looking at other hypotheses using a number of tools and approaches to do that. Um, so this is an open area of research. The measurements don't necessarily lie though. This ecosystem is accelerating growth. We have microbial consumption of CO2 uh, via photosynthesis, and that is increasing as well as particle export. And now we, these organisms that are largely invisible to us, yet they do enormous amount of work for our planet. We are literally asking them, can you do more? So I wanna put these changes in context. Um, again, this is measured increase in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, I was born in 1974 and the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was about 330 then. Um, we are now up to about uh, 420. So in my lifetime, although I'm not dead yet, um, but nearly five decades later, the CO2 change is about 100 parts per million. Is a change of 100 parts per million high at all? Well, if you look at ice core record of changes in CO2 over glacial and interglacial time periods, and that's what I'm showing you here, just pick any glacial interglacial time period from the ice cores. That change for 190 to 280 is also about 100 parts per million. So the increase in CO2 in a single human lifetime is equivalent to the change over tens of thousands of years between interglacial and glacial time periods. That is a rapid change that we have to slow. This is the trajectory we're on now, unprecedented. 
This is data from the latest um, IPCC report on the physical basis of climate change. And what I'm showing you here is the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions since 1850, and then the result of those emissions on global um, temperature. Now, the 2016 Paris Agreement set a pretty aspirational target of limiting war warming to a degree and a half. A new report came out recently that was talking about the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability of crossing these em emission thresholds. And they are profound. So this is that 1.5 degree emissions threshold. We're currently emitting about 35 gigatons of CO2 per year. If we want to stay on that less than 1.5 degree target, we need to cut somewhere on the order of 1 to 2 billion metric tons to stay below that 1.5 degree target. Now, that's a big ask, right? But we can do that. We already have. In the, in the pandemic, we saw a 17% uh, reduction in emissions. And that's on the order of what we need to address to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. Now, we don't want to do that with a pandemic. So <laughs> to do that without a pandemic where we're locked in our homes and wearing masks, we need structural changes to the economic transport or energy systems. But I share this because this should be a glimmer of hope that, in fact, we can uh, we can come together and enact this change. The, um, the lead cover to that IPCC report was a, a piece of art by an uh, artist named Elisa Singer called Changing. And she makes this um, comment that as we witness our planet transforming around us, we watch, listen, measure. And the time series work that I've shown you just a little glimpse of, that's our, that's our watching and our listening phase. And now we have to respond. And so what does that look like? This is uh, data also from um, UNEP where I'll walk you through it. This is our business as usual scenario of greenhouse gas emissions. Let's say we do nothing. All right, we're going to continue increasing greenhouse gases. We've all heard of the conventional abatement technologies, wind, nuclear, solar. If we invest strongly in those, we can make huge reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions. That's this green line here. There are still technologies that will continue to emit greenhouse gases, methane and CO2. But all of these model suggestions or projections suggest that if we want to meet these temperature thresholds, we also have to engage in carbon dioxide removal. We have to take carbon out of the atmosphere, which sounds crazy in a lot of ways. We have to remove this invisible gas from the atmosphere and put it somewhere else in order to reduce the warming of our planet. And this process is called carbon dioxide removal, CDR. It has increased in recent years. When I was first in the field, there was really strong opposition to what was seen as geoengineering. And there, there still is, there's still strong opposition by some, but there's a recognition that cutting emissions is not going to be sufficient to avoid dramatic warming. These are two statements of support. The first was by the Climate Works Foundation, which is a nonprofit, and they make the statement that CDR is a must have to solve the climate crisis. That in addition to slashing greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide needs to be removed from the atmosphere in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. The second statement was from the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, their fifth challenge was to unlock ocean-based solutions to climate change. And so this advocacy, it really stems from a realization that we perhaps waited too long to just reduce emissions alone. We also might need to buy time. Over the last few years, the National Academy of Sciences has, has published two consensus reports. One was dealing with negative emission technologies and reliable sequestration on land. 
and another, and here's the QR code you can scan if you're interested in it. You can also just Google National Academies carbon dioxide removal, um, was looking at ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. So taking carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in the ocean. And I'll first say that these reports, uh, these consensus reports are really rigorous. They identify a committee, they make sure there's no conflict of interest. They're given a clear statement of task. There's an information gathering phase. It's all a public process. The report gets written, then there's peer review. And ultimately this becomes what is presumably our best state of knowledge on this topic. So I was one of the 12 committee members, um, Scott Doney, some of you might know was the chair. And the rationale for this cartoon, this sort of crazy idea that you could take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the ocean was that the oceans cover 70% of our planet and they have a natural capacity for carbon sequestration. And there are known ways that you may be able to enhance the carbon storage capacity of the oceans. Now this is conversation, it's, it's a discussion that's really fraught with unease for many because it represents intentional perturbations of our ocean, more so than we've already done. And there's potential for unintended negative consequences. There was one author on the report that um, made this comment that I, I will always remember that you have to weigh carbon dioxide removal against the risk of doing nothing. So with that in mind, this was the charge of our committee, was to identify the urgent questions, to understand the viability of carbon dioxide removal and storing in the ocean, to define the research components of this program, to estimate costs and potential environmental impacts, and to recommend a path forward. These were the six strategies we considered I won't go into specifics of them because I want to leave time for Q&A, um, but I'll simply say that there were a number of strategies. There were biotic approaches from cultivation and burial of seaweed to allowing ecosystem recovery, to artificially upwelling nutrient-rich water to fertilize nutrient-poor regions of the ocean to adding iron to the surface. And this is an old idea, the old John Martin, give me a tanker of iron, I'll give you the next ice age. There were abiotic considerations, um, enhancing ocean alkalinity, electrical chemical processes. So a whole range of things that we considered. And in each one of them, we tried to, to um, to apply a unique assessment criteria, just basically asking like, will this crazy idea work? Um, what's the knowledge base? What do we know about it? How durable will CO2 removal be? That means like how long will you be able to store ocean the carbon dioxide in the oceans? Is it tens of years? Is it hundreds of years? How much confidence do you have in that? How effective will it be? Is this scalable? Um, what are the needs for monitoring and verification, which is not an easy feat in the ocean, right? This is a moving target. Um, what are the governance and social dimensions, the regulatory aspects, and any environmental impacts as well? And so we carefully tried to consider each one of these approaches. Now, this is not meant for you to, to read. That's why the QR code is there again. Um, it's just to represent the fact that we really carefully ranked these strategies based on the assessment. And this table shows a portion of that. Now, the important point is not a single one of them scored highly on every metric. Um, we identified aspects of foundational research that needs to happen regardless or whether any carbon dioxide removal strategy is pursued. And we, we did identify that there are some social and regulatory acceptability issues that are likely to be a barrier. And there needs to be a better understanding of the legality of CDR. For example, dumping iron uh, might be considered pollution in some areas, right? Enhancing nutrients in the coastal environment is pollution. Why would it be okay to do it in the open ocean, right? So there's a lot of questions about these processes. And last but not least, there needs to be a code of conduct. 
um, that would outline a transparent process that public and private entities would all follow, as well as a robust monitoring and verification plan, which is also not an easy thing to do when you consider that we're saying, did it, in a, a molecule of carbon dioxide make it to the deep sea? That's the question we're asking for monitoring and verification. But ultimately, the recommendation was that foundational research should proceed. We should be able to weigh this against the risk of doing nothing. The takeaways from this National Academy report were that emissions reductions are paramount. Under no circumstances should people think that iron fertilization should proceed without abatement technologies and structural changes to our energy systems. Ocean carbon dioxide removal could play the part, play a part in a portfolio of approaches and that fundamental research should be implemented to understand, will it work? What are the consequences? Will any of these approaches be feasible? The agenda that we outlined is to inform decision makers. It's not an endorsement of geoengineering, um, but it is saying that technical feasibility, can we do it? Can we add iron to the middle of the ocean? Is not enough. There needs to be policy support, accounting, and verification. But I'll paraphrase the IPC assessment by saying, any further delay in concerted global action on adaption and mitigation of carbon emissions will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. I'll come back to this carbon dioxide measurable um, trend that we've spent three decades uh, securing in the open ocean and say that you, like myself, may be uncomfortable with the notion of carbon dioxide removal. Perhaps you think that CDR might delay or deter uh, real reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe you'd be worried about unintended consequences or destruction of our wildest places or that industries or companies might profit. You might even find it ironic that we're looking to the ocean to store anthropogenic carbon dioxide at the same time that we fund large multidisciplinary programs or researchers like myself to understand and model how the oceans are storing carbon dioxide. Um, the data are really clear though, and that's what I'm showing you here. Um, CO2 is rising. This report suggested that the best approach for reducing knowledge gaps will be a diversified research investment, a strategy that includes ocean-based carbon dioxide in parallel with a whole range of other um, reductions. But in the end, you know, we have to look up and acknowledge this crisis. And perhaps my ocean microbes may just be able to, to buy us a little bit of time. So I'll end um, with this slide. Uh, the IPCC report also, the one that was released last month, noted that climate change is likely to bring great inequity. Um, there's a phrase in Hawaii, uh, as well as other Pacific islands, that we're all in the same boat. But there's a, a journalist, Damien Barr, um, has shared this quote that we're not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. Some of us are in canoes, some are in yachts, some are just holding on to a single oar. <laughs> So I, I, I thank you for your time today and for listening to my story because this is also your story to tell. The changing ocean, our changing planet and the evidence, the real measurable evidence of this change is a story that every one of us should be able to tell. Only then can we really gain the momentum that we need to protect this changing planet that we call home. So with that, I will end and say mahalo nui loa. Thank you all for your time. And I will open it up for any and all questions that you have. And thanks again for sustaining the technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Angelique, for a very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, we have uh, a few questions coming in, um, and I maybe just wanted to start with, can you comment on the time frame um, that you think is required for conducting the necessary research for the CDR that you're referring to? Yeah, um, we've outlined in the report sort of 10-year time frame and a, a sequence of costs. 
So we think modeling should begin immediately. The um, social justice framework, legal framework work need, needs to begin immediately. And, and then, you know, actual research and testing should begin, you know, in a few years as we start to understand the feasibility. And at any point in time, if it's, if it's clear that it's just not a viable option or it's not going to lead to durable sequestration, it should be stopped and we should move to something else. In, in terms of the regulatory aspects of that, how, do you, how does that work in a global framework in terms of decision-making? Yeah, it, it was really interesting learning from the economists and, and you know, the people who are more familiar with that um, as part of the, the CDR program. Um, there's no framework for it now. It's definitely, depending on what you're talking about, like even the seaweed aquaculture can involve dumping um, because, you know, there's a lot of nutrients that are required to sustain that. There may need to be nutrient additions. There's discussion of sort of using the burial of that seaweed as a sequestration. Um, so current uh, agreements against dumping um, would prohibit many of these activities. There's also the law of the sea. And so there's um, these activities have happened in the past. So that's, that was one of the key recommendations that we need to think about if, if either land-based or ocean-based sequestration is gonna happen, we need to start considering these things now. Great. Um, I have a question from Zach Dench and he, he first opens with, sorry if you missed us because he logged in late, um, but have you looked into leveraging carbon sequestration that is done by microbes in the deep sea sediments? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's a good question. There's a lot of these technologies, you know, um, that we have to think about how much energy do we put into it? Are we going to gain more um, energy from the sequestration than, than we do from the work itself? Moving something from the surface ocean to the deep sea forcibly requires a good bit of energy. Um, and so the ways that that has generally been suggested is either by artificial upwelling, which is these sort of passive wave pumps, or, you know, what was called, you know, there was an old um, Henry Stommel um, uh, saltwater fountains. So there are ways to move nutrients without requiring energy using the power of waves. And that that and the, and the you know, active settling of phytoplankton would be enough to move at least to the mesopelagic. But pumping CO2 into deep sea sediments um, is less uh, an option than pumping CO2 into certain um, types of rocks, carbonates that absorb CO2. So that's one of the sequestrations that has been suggested for land-based net emission technologies. All right, a question from Thomas Pease. Uh, the slide of anthropogenic uh, deposition shows even higher deposition in the equatorial Atlantic. Uh, do data from that area confirm your hypothesis that primary productivity increases due to deposition? Yeah, so, you know, deposition is one of the hypotheses we're working on. Um, and again, one of the incredibly important things about time series is the in situ measurements. We don't have time series in the equatorial Atlantic. And so you have to rely on satellite based estimates of primary productivity. All of the satellite-based estimates suggest that primary productivity is declining in the North Pacific. The absolute opposite trend. They miss the trend and the variability. So without sort of real bottled measurements and people on ships, it's hard to say what's happening in some of these more remote areas of the, of the ocean. Um, and also I'll, I'll caveat this, this idea of deposition you know, raining nutrients into the surface ocean, they're very nutrient limited populations. They would rapidly consume those nutrients. So how you, how you actually increase nutrients in the deeper ocean is a bit of a mystery. And so the working hypothesis goes that as you form uh, deep water that ends up getting circulated around the Pacific and ultimately upwelled near Aloha, not upwelled, but moved into the euphotic zone, um, that might be a method in which you could see this far field increase in production um, from anthropogenic further away from our area. But yeah, I can't answer your question about the Atlantic. I would just say that we typically would use models um, or satellites to get at that and they're, they don't match the in-situ data, at least for the Pacific. Uh, with the uh, increase in primary productivity and the sort of uh, microbial growth increases over 
time that you showed. Uh, do you know anything about the difference in the uh, sort of the community makeup or the diversity? Is there are the ch shifts and changes in the microbes there? Um, not measurable changes. Um, we have we're you know we typically look at the changes in the autotrophic population by flow cytometry, so we can measure the abundance of Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus and you know the general group of Pico eukaryotes, and their abundances aren't increasing. Um, the more the larger organisms, you know, back in the early 90s, like it, it was typical for people to filter water onto a filter and look under a microscope and count everything. And, you know, when we stopped doing that, we lost our ability to look at the abundance of diatoms or um, organisms like trichodesmium or, you know, small um, coccolithophores. So there's a whole class of organisms that we don't have a good time series for. One of my passions is starting to build these imaging technologies um, to get a better handle on the rare, larger organisms that we don't see as well with flow cytometry. Um, also, there's um, several researchers here at the university and, and collaborators who've been looking at, there's a metagenomic library at Station Aloha, and they're also building metatranscriptomic libraries here where you can start to ask those questions and they're publicly available data. That's great. So from that, I assume that then you can start to look at not only composite or community composition changes, but also functional changes within the, that as well. Yep. Um, all right. Um, from Dylan Comey asks, from an environmental justice perspective, what do you see as the biggest hurdle to tackling climate change and how can we strive for equity in the way we try to solve it? <laughs> that's that's a that's a really important question and um from an environmental justice perspective climate change is uh, there are great inequalities um we're certainly seeing that in the pacific islands where sea level rise which is something that we can't walk back we can't refreeze the glaciers um you know is, is very strongly impacting these populations um i i don't know the answer to to that really i mean i my my response to it has been to, to do things like this, to, to scream at the top of my lungs, to make sure that everybody at least has a few talking points. And when someone says, no, this is not caused by humans, they can go and you know show the Keeling curve and show the Aloha curve and look at these changes and, and point to the ice cores and say, yes, it is. And you know try to move the ball in, in the global reckoning of, of really actually you know, taking some forward steps, recognizing that if we want to think of equality and justice, we, we first have to do something and we're doing nothing. Um, just to, to sort of uh, collectively uh, sort of couple some of the questions together, um, can, you, can you maybe articulate what are some of the potential risks to carbon sequestration or, or carbon uh, CDR? Yeah, so there's a whole range of, of things from, um, you know, everything from generation of harmful algal bloom forming species that, you know, produce toxins that could, you know, filter up the food web um, to um, production of oxygen minimum zones. If you're increasing productivity, um, you often, by adding organic matter, can create oxygen deficient zones. Um, one of the other ones that I wasn't really aware of is as you're changing sea surface temperature gradients and changing productivity, you may be sort of robbing downstream processes. So consumption of nutrients in one place is one place in the ocean changes the abundance of nutrients in another place in the ocean. Um, things like artificial upwelling, bringing cold water to the surface could change weather patterns, could change rainfall patterns, depending on the scale of artificial upwelling. And that's one where, you know, you can just do the math from the work that we have and you'd need millions and, you know, tens of millions of these pumps out there to, to get a gigaton addition of carbon sequestration per year. So that would need to be something on a very large scale. So you would also have, um, you know, interference with shipping lanes and um, all sorts of things like that. Uh how about, um, are, are microbes more adaptable and resilient to climate change than higher organisms? Well, they certainly have shorter lives. Um, 
And, you know, from a genetic perspective, um, you can look at certain types of organisms, you know, types of dinoflagellates that have genomes that are larger than ours and the ability to be autotrophic and heterotrophic and mixotrophic and steal organelles from other organisms and be kleptoplastic. And, and so, uh, I mean, when I look at the genetic diversity and the functional diversity of these organisms, it's hard not to imagine that they're resilient and that there is functional redundancy, that something will take the place and, and the ecosystem function will continue. Most of the experiments that have been done are short-sighted, much like our political cycles, right? You will instantly change the CO2 and look at how um, the organisms respond. You know, in fact, we're doing the experiment on the right time scales, you know, and not seeing yet. There are also a whole series of, of a whole field of research that looks at emergent time scales. And so once you start to know the variability of an ecosystem, you can start to say how long it would take, how long the perturbation would need to be before you would start to see the signal arise from the noise. And in this case, I mean the anthropogenic signal. And at least for the North Pacific, we're just now getting to the point three decades later where we should start to see measurable change in some of the community composition and their functional responses. All right, maybe, maybe just one last question. This is really just a logistic question, but how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your data collection for the ocean for the HOTS time series? Yeah, it didn't make it easy. Um, you know, we didn't lose any cruises, but um, we had in the beginning two week strict quarantines um, where we weren't, you know, allowed to leave our homes and asking our partners not to do so either. Um, we had to go, we had to sail on the cruises with a very reduced personnel. Um, we kind of miss it now because everybody had their own berth, which was nice. You didn't have to share a room. <laughs> you had two bunks to yourself and a bathroom. Um, but we had to extend the cruises because we had less people. So we did a little bit more with those times. We wore masks at sea. Um, but thankfully, we, we didn't see any reduction. Um, we also, and I see some of the questions in the chat about iron, um, we have had some um, collaborators in the last few years that have been looking at um, anthropogenic iron, um, so aerosol iron, but also iron in seawater. And you know, we think we saw a little bit of a decrease in iron deposition rates that may be also related to COVID and reduction of transport and fossil fuels. Um, so we might have seen some little dips in the system, but we, we soldiered on and managed all of our cruises and um, we're really grateful to have had the opportunity to do that, but it, it certainly was a challenge for people. That's amazing. It's great that there's no uh, data gap in, in your in your time series. So that's terrific to know. Um, so, so with that, I, I really like to, to thank you so much, Angelique, for your wonderful talk tonight um, and the Q&A. And uh, I will uh, turn things back over to, to Chris to wrap up for the evening. Great. Thank you so much, Angelique and Andrea, for sharing your time, your work, and your stories with all of us. And to everyone out there for joining in and asking some great questions and continuing to support GMGI's mission. We're so grateful. Please stay tuned and stay in touch. We have one more science hour coming up uh, for this series on April 28th. Um, I'm going to post that now. So if you stay on one more minute, you can save the date. Good night, everyone, and I hope I'll see you Tuesday at the Academy Open House, and if not, next month on the small screen. Be well, and thank you again, everyone. <laughs>